Hey, what a day, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got ourselves a big fat Wednesday on our hands here, and strangely enough, everything is up, Edward. You know, the, the commodity page that I follow, oil's up $2.40, $2.40 a barrel, copper's up about six cents. But why? Natural gas is up eight cents. Why? Uh, apparently, some economic data came out of China that suggests that things are, they said it was Surprisingly positive data. Economic data out of China. Out of economic, and that's on the Isn't same. Isn't like a contradiction in terms? Economic data out of China. <laughs> <laughs> that's like saying China is a free market. <laughs> Anyways, so the protesters are making headway. They got that extradition legislation was withdrawn by yeah, yeah. the governor, and that's like Carrie, that's what they want. Carrie Wan, or I think his yeah. name is Carrie so Wan. She, so she, she actually, yeah. So that means now are the protests officially over? I don't know where there's where there's uh, one uh, one. Uh, what's the word? What are those little insects called? You know those uh, when you see one locust. Roach? No, not what am I thinking of? Cockroach? Cockroach. You see, Cockroaches. You see, it's more, it's more than one cockroach. Oh, you mean they're protesters? I more know. No, you know, you know what? We're in a crazy world. Like the stuff that's going on. Yeah. You know, like you, you watch the news, and uh, it's hard not to get. You, when you listen, they say, "Holy shit!" Like this, people are getting murdered all the place and everything. Uh, yeah. Um, what do you think? Coming up on today's show, we've got Matt Bottomley from Canaccord Genuity is here. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, finding the next big cannabis deal. Um, but uh, Charles Turk is also going to be here this afternoon from uh, the Nine Point uh, UIT Alternative Healthcare Fund, uh, which is Charles is the president of Faircourt Asset Management. And uh, without uh, further ado, here's Alessandro Bruno with some news. Here's what's making cannabis news today. Believe Inc. reported its consolidated financial statements for the year ending March 31, 2019 and 2018. 2019 net revenue was $2.4 million, net loss was $33.8 million or $0.08 cents per share. Cash at the end of 2019 was $538,000. Halo Labs Inc. provided an operational update given recent developments at Buffalo Biosciences Ltd in Lesotho, Africa. Halo and Bofello are in the process of nego negotiating mutually agreeable definitive agreements and the parties expect to sign such definitive agreements within the next 30 days. Bofello Bioscience is the holder of one of a limited number of licenses issued in Lesotho for the production of medicinal cannabis products. The first summer growing cycle on Bofalo's initial 5 hectare site is expected to begin in the fourth quarter of 2019 with the first harvest to occur in early second quarter of 2020. Bofalo has been conditionally approved for 200 hectares of outdoor cannabis grow operations and intends to grow cannabis strains that are both high in CBD and THC content as well as producing THC distillate and CBD isolate, providing cost-efficient production capabilities. Chiron Life Sciences Corporation has commenced construction of a 105,406 square feet cultivation and processing facility in Juan Lacaze, Uruguay. With a production capacity of 17 tons per year, the company's investment in this facility represents a significant increase in Chiron's total production capacity, strengthening its ability to export and supply cannabis to key international markets, including Brazil and Europe. Construction is underway and is scheduled for completion in mid Q3 2020. The cultivation area and processing plant will be built to meet the requirements of good agricultural practices and good manufacturing practices. Keeping with Chiron's continued 
expertise and core commitment to regulatory and operational compliance. Alifia Health Inc. has acquired the farmland directly adjacent to its Port Perry outgrow grow facilities. The purchase will allow the company to commence its outdoor grow phase two expansion, adding an additional 60 acres of cannabis cultivation area for a total of 86 acres. The transaction closed with a cash purchase of $1.2 million. Aurora Cannabis Inc. disposed its remaining 28.8 million shares, representing 10.5% of the issued and outstanding shares of the Green Organic Dutchman at a price of $3 per share for aggregate gross proceeds of $86.5 million. The completion of the sale of TGOD shares represents an approximately 50% internal rate of return for the company. Aurora no longer holds any shares of TGOD, however, does continue to hold warrants to purchase 16.67 shares of TGOD. Canon One Technologies Inc. has entered into a letter of intent to acquire 100% interest in Real Life Sciences Inc. On April 23, uh, 2019, Canon One Technologies announced a formal partnership with Real Life Sciences to launch and operate the BeWell CBD online marketplace in the United States. Under the terms of this agreement, Real Life Sciences acted as local managing partners for the BeWell online marketplace, providing strategic management, financial and business development expertise. As the managing partner of the BeWell marketplace, Real Life Sciences maintained a 75.1% ownership interest. CO2 Grow Inc announced it is in the process of further strengthening its patent portfolio. Grow has filed two additional patent require applications under the Patent Cooperation Treaty. The filings further secure Grow's intellectual property around nutrient delivery technologies, especially in the case of outdoor value crops and nutrient constituents delivered. Grow now has five corporate patent filings of which Four were made year-to-date 2019. Emerald Health Therapeutics Inc. and Village Farms International Inc. announced their 50% owned joint venture. Pure Sun Farms has entered into a supply agreement with the British Columbia Liquor Distribution Branch to supply Pure Sun Farms branded cannabis products for the British Columbian recreational market. Pure Sun Farms will begin shipping to the BCLDB and Ontario Cannabis Retail Corporation as soon as it receives its Health Canada license amendment permitting sales and distribution of packaged cannabis products. Fire and Flower Holdings Corporation has entered into asset purchase agreements with wholly owned subsidiaries of Cannabis Cowboy Inc. for eight proposed cannabis retail stores under development in the province of Alberta. All acquired locations, other than one, have received municipal development permits for a cannabis retail sales use. Medman Enterprises Inc. has closed its previously announced acquisition of One Love Beach Club. This acquisition further enhances Medman's California footprint by adding a location strategically situated between the existing Santa Ana and LAX stores. MedMen is licensed for 17 stores across California, of which 13 are currently operational. And that's your cannabis news for today. For the latest cannabis news, visit the Cannabis Daily on MidasLetter.com. Oh yes, and I did forget to mention that Bruce Linton will be joining us in just a little while. We had a conversation with him and Jeff Zanari, who is uh, who is the head of uh, The Art of the Deal, which is a, a U.S. publication. Yeah. Um, Jeff's co-hosted an interview with me or two. Uh, and I wanted to just shout out to all of the people in our chat room who are our regular friends. Reefer Aljoint, Aaron B., Aris Shapira, Nika Domi, of course, Heinrich Sjoblom, 
uh, Faye Smith. Heinrich, I apologize if I'm butchering your name. Maybe you could spell it out phonetically for me and I can get it right once and for all. Uh, Aaron B says, no Bruce. Yes, there is a Bruce. Yes, Aaron, there will be a Bruce. Um, let's see, we also have, yeah, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Turk will be here. Charles Turk from the uh, Faircourt Asset Management 9-point UIT Alternative Healthcare Fund to talk about his top picks in the cannabis space. And uh, with that, let's take a quick look at what some of our, uh, what our sponsor is up to. Uh, here's a nice big picture for you of uh, Halo Labs uh, Grow Operation Oregon. Halo is a client. Um, you can visit them at halocana.com. Uh, just for those who don't quite understand what I mean by Halo is a client, they are a financial supporter of Midas Letter and therefore all of our commentary and content surrounding them should be regarded as biased. In fact, if you were a smart little chipmunk, you should just consider everything you hear on this show as biased because we're market participants. We are marketers, we're financial communicators, and we are simply not to be trusted. And orators. And orators. Orators. Philosophers. Philosophers, joke tellers. Joke tellers. Why did the chicken cross the road? Uh, yeah, I don't know either. Um, yeah, so basically we wear a lot of hats around here when we wear hats. Yeah. Some days we don't wear any hats. Other days, that's all we do is wear hats. But uh, yeah, so there you have it. Um, some of the interesting news today that the, uh, the Hong Kong kids succeeded in their endeavor to have the legislation that would see extraditions made possible to the mainland from Hong Kong withdrawn. Cheers to you guys. Bravo, bravo. Don't turn your backs on those uh, government gun-toting apes for one moment, will you? Um, what else happened today? Well, there was some... Uh, where is my notes here? Boy, oh boy. Sometimes I'm organized. Sometimes I feel like a nut. Sometimes, sometimes I don't. You don't. Um, and where did my notes go? You notice that uh, one of the companies mentioned on the, uh, on the news lost $33 million dollars last year believe and and apparently they then they went on to say at the end of 2019 with their year end they're sitting with a balance of half a million dollars but 538,000 yeah I don't see that's not gonna get very far so they're gonna be raising money there's already 450 million shares outstanding well I don't know maybe they got lots of weed to sell oh yeah maybe they got yeah. a crop well, that's gonna pull them out of the quagmire they they, they, they sold in that period 2.4 million dollars worth of Maybe they have a white knight. White knight. White knight. Somebody's oh. going to ride in on shining armor on a white knight, white horse. Right. And shower them with riches. Shower them. Shower like them. manna from heaven. Manna from heaven. Exactly. Manna from heaven. Um, Where are you from? I'm a manna from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, fell from the sky when my aeroplane turned it upside down. I'm so sorry to a land on your land. Um, U.S. stocks futures rose amid a global rally today, um, which I, the S&P was on a bit of a tear. Gold! Up, up 27 uh, S&P points, and it's right at, in fact, I think it's worth noting, if we put up the S&P chart, which I'm going to do right now, I think we should look at this. Oh, you're threatening to put up the S&P chart, are you? And if I can do it in 10 seconds, 10 name seconds that tune. 10 seconds or less? What I'm going to, what I want to, okay, here we are. So, so let's just take this and go for a three, all right, this area here, double click. There's a, there's a line of resistance across that, right there. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you can see that green candle today can't get to the top of the red candle two days ago. And if you look at all those candles, they all sort of stop around the same point. So I'm gonna say that's becoming a line of major resistance until it's broken. In well, it, it, it may go sideways for a while. It may go on for another, it, I mean, who's to say, right? Who knows? But right now it's range bound and there's a slight upward bias here, I think. Not much. So it may just go back and forth for a while. Hmm. Anyway, that's the S&P. And there you have it. Uh, gold was up. Well, it's still up significantly. Touched a high of what was it, 1555 today? Uh, I 1557, saw. 1557, 1558. Yeah, 1558, I guess, was the intraday high. On the, on the futures contract, or do you care about the futures contract? Well, sure. Who doesn't care about the future? I mean, what kind of nihilist would not care about the future? Right. I mean, if you don't care about the future, you are, well, you're either extremely zen 
in your outlook. I don't care about the future. I don't care about the past. I only care about where I am right now. Or you're a fucking lunatic who should be shot in the head. Everybody should care about the future. I mean, God damn it. Okay, so God damn it. Gold, I'm a doctor. Gold hit 15, six, almost 1565 on the nearby month. 1565. That's a new, fresh. 1565? Yeah. What? That's a three month. No, that, that, that's the highest. For December delivery? That, yes. Fucking three, 1565. Well. Wow. Now it's 16, 1562. The point is those recent highs. Yeah. And we can, we can, we'll use the, uh, we'll use the ETF, the, the big ETF chart to just to. And by the way, you know, this ETF is supposedly one tenth of an ounce of gold. But no. look. Really? Yeah. One, what? One tenth oh, of an ounce on. of gold. No, really? but, Jesus, you expect people to believe that, Ed? Come on. That's what it is. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so, so look, ETF. so this is a high. If you go, this, this is a three month chart. Yeah. That's the highest it's been right there, that last candle. Oh, huh. I fucked uh, up. I always, you know, never, okay. There we go. There, that high. That's a new high. There, we're in new high territory. On no, no, which one? That's the GLD, which is the GLD. That tracks gold dollar for dollar. The difference is storage. You don't storage. have to pay storage with this because it's an ETF. You just buy it and right. let it sit in your account. But All you're right. buying a tenth of an ounce here. No. Each each one of these it things is like a, tenth a little of bit of fun there. Yeah. So you buy ten and you get ten ounces. You got an ounce. If it's one tenth of an ounce, you yeah, buy no, ten. Yeah. No, you got, got an ounce. Ten, that's right. It's something like that. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, you were never a drug dealer, no, were no. you? No. Jesus <laughs> Christ. No. You would know that if you were. Had you been? Not that I had. Yeah. Been. Yeah. Look, look, it's we're, now, we're in a bull market in gold, that much we know, yes. and, and just about everything now is perceived as bullish for gold. That's how it changes. Really? And, and, Currencies and, and the, are worthless? And the higher it goes, the less there'll be less inclination to sell yes. into a rising market because people are greedy. What about cryptos? I don't know much about cryptos. I could never really understand it, but I think uh, someone t sent me an article that said that somebody bought two Papa John's pizzeria and paid the owner. 10,000 Bitcoin, and no that kidding. Bitcoin is now worth $135 million. Really? So that seems a bit expensive for a couple of Papa John's Well, he, he didn't pay it. When, he I mean, bought the it. He bought them when the, when the cryptos were worthless, like they okay. were trading for nothing. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Geez, so I bet you the guy who sold, bought the two pizza parlors is now sitting there thinking, great, now I got to stick around and make pizza. Well, as I could have been sitting on the beach on Easy Street drinking boat I know, drinks I know. with umbrellas. He probably on. thought, you know what, this idiot's Fuck. taking cryptocurrency for my 10,000. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. So, uh, yeah. well, what are you going to do? Huh? What are you going to do? Huh? Yeah, I, I, I'm very curious to see how this, all this, you know, evolves and become like what, what's going to happen here. But we'll, we'll never know. No. No, I There's noticed, no, no uh, answer. I noticed that the uh, cannabis sector is more or less flat. Which is disconcerting to say the least. You know, Tilray got down to 27.75, a, a nice correction from its high yesterday of 31. Yes. And then rallied to th almost 32. Tilray, you it, don't it, say. From the bottom, yeah, about four four dollar move. Wow. Four dollar move, and and now I think it's back to just above 30. Uh, so, some of them are moving. I see Namaste's put on a few more cents. Yeah, what's what's going on there? Well, who the hell yeah, knows? You eh? know. You don't know, do you? Yeah, maybe no, some you don't. shorts okay. are, Anyways. shorts are, uh, uh, you're going to get us in trouble. No, 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 no. Uh, look, 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 Halo look, look. Labs is, uh, you know, one of the uh, sponsors what... of our show. Um, and also Matt Bottomley was here and he had some really interesting to s things to say. He has not lost one bit of enthusiasm for his, uh, for the cannabis space. And uh, let's let him tell that story. Hey, I'm James West. And I'm Jeff Zaninieri. And we're here with Matt Bottomley, the cannabis analyst from Canaccord Genuity, and we're in pursuit of the next big cannabis deal. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, Matt, Matt um, you've just put out a quite an extensive piece on the state of the cannabis industry. And uh, give us an overview of what is the essential tone of your piece. 
Well, really, it's trying to line up what's happening from a macro level in the United States right now with all this different state legislation, whether it's medical and recreational programs, and lining that up with what's a growing list of what I call, what the industry calls, multi-state operators. So operators are in, let's say, a dozen or so states right now, and just trying to line up who exactly has an edge where, and where are these markets going. And I would say the overall thesis of this report is, with valuations down over 50% since uh, 2019 highs. I think given some near-term catalysts like the DOJ potentially closing some of these uh, these large cap deals, uh, the fact that the summer months are unfortunately now uh, becoming behind us and there's more butts and shares as I like to say, uh, as well as I think overall positive Q2 earnings where companies are reaching profitability, I think this might be a great time to get ahead of some of those catalysts and take a deeper dive into these multi-state operator names. Mm -hmm. So you see the future of the cannabis industry for investors as a primarily U.S. opportunity? No, I I think it's global, but I think when you look at what's happening internationally right now, the medical cannabis programs are still very nascent, whether it's in Germany, Australia, and then there's sort of the CBD or hemp-derived CBD health and wellness, all still at a very nascent, uh, uh, nascent stage right now. So it's hard to really get stories out there that can give investors confidence that there's going to be winners today that can be picked in those markets. I think in the U.S., it's the nearest term opportunity given that state-by-state -state legislation for recreational purposes has been happening uh, for about five or six years now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in terms of early stage private opportunities that individual investors don't necessarily get to see unless they're fortunate enough to be proximal to the opportunity, what are the sectors that you are focused on most in a, on an early stage basis where you find them the segment or the sector a sort of risk acceptable opportunity? Well, it depends. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty big question because a lot of when I, you know, when I see certain opportunities like that, it has to do with doing general due diligence for whether it's just checking out a state, whether there's a, a big operator in that state that I'm touring. And I think that as cannabis acceptance continues to grow uh, and as it becomes a little more le legitimate, legitimatized, if that's a word, mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that you're going to see boats start rising with, with the tides, as they say. So what I've seen in interesting plays is extraction opportunities or one-off brands um, that like to, uh, you know, maybe you need the working capital in order to really uh, carve out a market share somewhere and combine with larger companies. Um, and then it also depends on the region. Colorado right now is probably going to be a very, very interesting uh, hotbed for private deals because the legislation recently changed to allow public company ownership. So I think you're going to see, uh, given that there's hundreds and hundreds of players there, some of these large multi-state operators go around and find sort of the winners that have key dispensaries there that can, that can help their, their platform. Mm -hmm. And that's the area that you would expect that the, the big boys are going to go shopping in, in that sector, in dispensaries? Yeah, I think right now retail is sort of the, the gatekeeper in order to get to the end user, and that's just a function of what the legislation allows. I, I don't see any reason why over the longer term it won't go to an Amazon model or cannabis if it becomes legalized at the federal level will be allowed in more traditional retail stores. Uh, you know, f pharmacies and grocery stores like that. But I think right now, because it's such a closely held sector, um, state by state in terms of what's allowed, um, that right now retail is the only way to get to the consumer at scale. And because there really isn't uh, a national brand winner yet, I mean, different regions have it, uh, I think that's the best way to bu build goodwill right now is to get um, strategic retail in important markets like California or Los Angeles, like MedMen does, or on the East Coast in, in Boston, like Columbia Care has good exposure there. Um, once that licensing comes on, or in Florida with TrueLeaf, these are the markets where I think uh, national mind share can be won. Mm -hmm. So you think that in the private side, there's still opportunities to focus on elements like uh, localized market, a state market, as opposed to trying to be all things to all people right out of the chute? Yeah, I think that that's a big challenge that a lot of these billion dollar companies have right now is they're sort of trying to do everything at once because it's a bit of a foot race. So there's still a lot of private companies in the California market, I mentioned in, in Colorado, where um, the opportunity for potential capital that's been raised in the public market to be, to, to be deployed through acquisitions or, or through other financings into the private sector is going to be for where the, where the needs are as the market develops. So it could be delivery uh, platforms. I know that there's a couple of big ones out of California. It could be, like I said, certain extraction uh, companies that have a different uh, niche in terms of how they extract it or, or, or a following with their actual technologies or the, 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 the output that they have from that. Um, or it could be any number of things. There's technology platforms for, um, uh, for doing seed to sale tracking. So this is kind of the picks and shovel um, uh, rationale for that. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities that come through various states as they become more and more advanced in, in building out their programs. Sure. How big of an effect will 
the legalization of cannabis at the federal level in the United States have on valuations of U.S. MSOs and private companies? And when do you see that happening? Well, I think timing's everything. So I think that as long as the average investor believes that it is an inevitability that will, it will occur, and I believe that that will happen. I mean, we have 33 states that have legal cannabis in, in some form, and that's at an accelerating pace. I mean, there was really only a handful to talk about six or seven years ago. Um, so I think in that regard that federal legalization or the, the prospect of it at some point down the road, let's call it two to five years, really allows the companies today to build up infrastructure and assets and again, some mind share where they could be huge candidates for the next Constellation Brands or Altria that wants to come into the space and maybe look at an MSO instead of a, a Canadian LP. The flip side of that is if it happens tomorrow, it would be terrible for valuations because you really want to build the moat a little bit stronger than it is today. I still think we were close to that tipping point, but as we know, it's not going to happen tomorrow. So I think there's, there's a bit of a relief there that all the, the MSOs have. But obviously, the, the, the multiple expansion is going to be significant uh, as we get more clarity. It just it needs to be sort of another year or two out so that different markets that are just starting to ramp up now can actually get, you know, bear hug certain, certain regions uh, where they would have to be a takeout candidate as opposed to someone coming in fresh to compete. Mm -hmm. Um, back of the napkin, we could say that there's roughly $200 billion in the global cannabis space, and that's including a rough estimate of private, so that's not a real a number that we can derive from data per se, but even that, that big a number, would you say that the future of the cannabis space, the biggest money, is still yet to be made? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the quickest money might have been made already, depending on how you look at the, the, the charts. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, I was on vacation end of... Uh, 2017 when the stocks were going up 30% every day. I don't know if we'll see that environment again, but who knows, stranger things have happened. But I think the, you know, where we are in the actual uh, cycle in terms of peak valuation, uh, I think we're well, very far away from it. It's going to be different though, right? It's, if you look back to the tech days, there was, you know, a tremendous bubble, a tremendous amount of companies that turned out not to really come into fruition, but that market cap and valuation eventually flowed into the big names like Google and Amazon and what we have today. So the market cap is actually significantly bigger in that sector compared to where it used to be. The allocation is much, much different, uh, 180 degrees. I expect we might see some of that in the cannabis sector as winner, winners and losers start to separate. Mm -hmm. we're, we're as concerned about oversaturation and what not to invest in, because we, we're really focused on like the turbocharged growth sectors mm -hmm. where the meat's still on the bone, so to speak. Is there anything you'd avoid with all this legislation rollout happening in the U.S.? Yeah, I think uh, not being vertically integrated is, is, is typically one of the big risks, particularly if you are a cultivator. Uh, I mean, the actual cannabis plant itself, there's a, there's a percentage of users, I'm sure, that are very artisan and it really matters in terms of how the, uh, how the product is developed and grown and extracted. But if you're not sort of in that 5% of, uh, of growers or, or extractors that maybe are competing for that market, it really is just a commodity. It's a raw material for recreational purposes. It's a, an API if you want to consider it a medical pharmacy pharmaceutical uh, ingredient. So from that standpoint, anyone that's telling you, you know, I need $10 million to finish a facility and I'm going to be the best grower in California, I mean, sure, do your due diligence, but I would question that more. Um, and the other thing is just depending on where markets are. In Washington State right now, it's, it's a fairly large market, but you're not allowed to be vertically integrated. And if you're a public company, for whatever reason, you're not allowed to show an economic variable interest to your investment, which means you know that your dispensaries can do 30 million a year, but you have to have the same management fee every quarter until you ratchet that up. So it's not very attractive from a from a standpoint of a, of a public company investment or a private company that eventually wants to go public. Um, and then markets like Oregon, where it's very hard to be profitable just because the regulators have allowed too many uh, too many uh, retailers to open up on, on seemingly every corner. So it depends on what part of the value chain you're competing in and what geography. Are there any black swan states that people don't have on their radar that could be game changers, like in New York? There's a big there? one, and I don't know if it's not on people's radar, but it's Texas, right? Because Texas right now only has sort of preliminary five or six uh, licenses that might be uh, utilized for a very, very, very um, modest medical market. And that's a market that eventually, at least in my view, whether it's two, three, four, five years from now, uh, probably one of the later ones, eventually if you have, you know, close to all the states legalized, there's going to be political pressures for tax revenues and access to medicine and all those things. Uh, and that's a huge market. I mean, it's one of the bigger markets, probably not by percentage of usage, but certainly by population. Um, so that's one where a lot of MSOs aren't talking about it publicly, but they're trying to line up if they can get one of those five or six 
preliminary licenses right now so that if, because we all know in the sector when things move, it, it can move fast. As much as things get delayed, eventually um, things do start to accelerate. So that's one market. And another market that I'm very fond of, uh, only as of you know, the last six months when I really toured it, um, but I think it's on people's radar, is Pennsylvania. That's a, an incredible market in terms of uh, what producers are allowed to uh, to manufacture there? What uh, uh, you know the ability for patients to get access right now? It's a medical only market uh, for chronic pain and other and other things like that. So it's probably got 100, 150 thousand registered patients. So maybe half or two thirds the size of Florida. Um, and you know right now everyone's kind of just building out their first three or four dispensaries so you don't have like a true leave yet that's dominating that market but I think that's one of the top medical markets right now to, to, to keep your eyes on uh, outside of some of the the sexier stories like Illinois and Massachusetts that are going recreational all right Matt that's a great contribution as per usual thanks very much for joining us yeah today. take care Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. All right, that Matt Bottomley is a smart fella, and uh, no wonder Can Accord Genuity does so well in the cannabis space with him right in the research. He just completed a 100-page report. You should uh, consider opening an account at Canaccord Genuity if you want regular access to his level of intelligence. Information is the key, Edward. Information. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. That's what you need, you know, the goddamn information. Um, oh, uh, and also, speaking of smart fellers, we had another smart feller in the house today, and that was Mr. Charles Turk, president of the Fair Court Asset Management you don't, Firm. You don't say. And he's also the fund manager, principal of the UIT, Nine, nine Point UIT Alternative Healthcare Fund, and here is Jane. Uh, Charles Turk joins us now. He's the president of Fair Court Asset Management and the portfolio advisor to the Nine Point Alternative Health Fund. Chuck, welcome back. Thank you very much. Hope everyone had a great summer. We had a great summer. Um, me and Jeff Zanzinieri are in the process of looking for the next big cannabis deal. And you have an extreme wealth of expertise and experience in investing in early stage cannabis deals. Sure. How important is it in the strategy of the UIT Alternative Health Fund to invest in private placements before the companies actually go public? It's uh, very, very important. From the very beginning, uh, so as a mutual fund, we can own or invest up to 10% of the fund's capital in private equity. And uh, so what we've done is we have chosen companies that are you know three to six months away from an RTO as well as some companies that are a little bit longer uh, but we see great promise in in their their business uh, not really Canadian companies uh, looking at American businesses and looking at European companies uh, looking at one Israeli company that we've invested in uh, it's really important because the valuation metrics that you're able to get early on are much lower um, than the, the public sector multiples. Plus, uh, you're getting benefits, whether there are warrants attached, whether it's a convertible DEB that's got preferential treatment on the exercise price. Uh, plus, you're able to help shape the future of this company. And, uh, and that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give me an example. We just had Bruce Linton on set. Yeah, uh, it's nice to run into Bruce. You bet. And uh, so he's got his ideas about the importance of being early and how he's going to provide access to us to his early stage endeavors in the next chapter of his professional life. Okay. Um, tell me about the uh, access that you've had in the past and specifically with your experience with Canopy in which you were somewhat early. Sure. Well, okay, so Canopy's a, a unique story <laughs> given, given uh, Bruce was just here. Uh, Canopy has been or was in our fund in a significant way for over two years. Uh, the fund is two and a half years old, so probably going back to May or June of 2017, and it's been a top 10 uh, holding of ours since then. Uh, with the uh, unceremonious departure <laughs> of Mr. Linton, we took the view that uh, Canopy now is a very different company. 
We don't know who's going to be running it next. We don't know what the new leadership at Constellation wants for Canopy. And um, so we took the approach that until there's clarity, uh, we're going to take the opportunity and exit. So at the end of uh, July was the first month where Canopy Growth was no longer in our top 10. So we sold it down in a big way, also anticipating that the next quarter, which came out um, middle of the summer, uh, was pretty horrible. Right. And, um, and now the stock has trended down. So we're uh, being cautious on the name for now, but so maybe a testament to Bruce that we liked it then. Now we're uh, on the sidelines, but absolutely correct. Uh, you know, when you own a stock at a dollar or 50 cents, and it rides up to $20 or $30, um, that's one to write home about. Um, and so you don't care if it was at 50, came back to 20, you know, you're still sitting with such a low cost, adjusted cost base. You're free rolling. You're still, that's right. I mean, it's been a challenging summer, Charles, but yes, you know, if you take the longer view, which we all should as investors, mm -hmm. this is an opportunity, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Um, we've, we've done a couple things. You know, you, when we meet with advisors um, and clients, they're obviously shaken because the last three or four months have not been kind to the sector. Right. But if you take the longer term view, you know, we're still up um, on the year. We're still up since inception. And, uh, you know, we believe that we're at a really interesting inflection point given what we've done with the portfolio. So obviously we're active managers and we exit positions when we don't feel things are going well. Like in the spring, we sold our position in Cantrust in April, uh, got out around nine or $10 because at the time their quarter was weak. We didn't like the margins and the revenue prospects. And so we exited long before you know July 8th. Uh, so being active allows us to take the capital and do other things with it. Uh, we've really reoriented the portfolio more towards the U.S. multi-state operators yeah. than to the Canadian names. And we started really doing that at the beginning of this year. And, you know, the payoff we think is going to begin shortly now that we've gone through the summer. The last two weeks, the uh, U.S. MSOs have all delivered really strong quarterlies. So top line revenue growth Sig significant revenue growth quarter over quarter, let alone year over year. It's just been phenomenal. But more important and very different from most of the Canadians is they've got cash flow. They've got bottom line positive EBITDA. And for many of the Canadian companies, they're, uh, they're having trouble generating. And I think that's part of the problem with an investor's viewpoint of yeah. this sector is when do these companies become profitable? So that's why we've we've moved to the, uh, you know orienting to the U.S. names like a Curaleaf, Cresco, uh, GTI. Hmm. Those those names are are really doing quite well. And how has the fund done in this environment over the last few months? Yeah, so um, this is still a focused cannabis fund. So remember that uh, that uh, when you look at it that way, year to date, we're up uh, seven point six percent. Um, and when you compare that to the HMMJ, HMMJ is up 1.3%. So significant outperformance for the year to date marker and more pronounced when we look at a one year number uh, to the end of August, we're flat for one year, but HMMJ is down 30%. And so when people most often compare us, because HM, HMMJ is, is a large ETF, uh, what's the value in the ETF? Uh, I would suggest, you know, people really take a look at it because this is a passive fund. Uh, they're going to take on positions every quarter, regardless of where they're trading, whereas we have the benefit of being active. And so some great examples, both being early and exiting early, uh, would be, uh, you know, looking at Tilray. Uh, Tilray went public a year ago at $17 mm -hmm. and we were in the IPO and over a five week period, it went up to $92. At that point, we sold it. It was our biggest return for 2018. But HMMJ didn't take it on until the third week of September last year at $140. Uh, Tilray is now trading in the high 20s. As an active manager, yeah. you can be a bit more discerning yes. on subsectors. 
Are there any you're particularly hot on, and or any also like within hate? cannabis or just yeah, within outside? cannabis? Yeah, within cannabis. Well, as I said, we uh, you know the we certainly like the U.S. names. Yeah. Um, and within Canada, we we like the extractors here. You know the um, uh, Metafarm, Valens are both showing the benefits of what the services provide. And, uh, and each of them, as Cannabis 2.0 gets rolled out, are both going to have great opportunities, sign more contracts, get more distribution, uh, whether it's private labeling or tolling, uh, the, the growth that they're going to achieve without having to put capital in the ground on the agricultural side is going to be representing you know, higher uh, return on invested capital. So that's why we like the extractors necessarily you know, more than just owning the LPs. Mm -hmm. In terms of early stage uh, pre-public mm -hmm. cannabis opportunities, yep. where do you see the greatest opportunity for investors in what sort of segment? Well, uh, again, focused more so on the global market and the U.S. market because we have to remember as Canadians, we're only 37 million people. So you want to find companies that are taking advantage of large addressable markets. So in the U.S., even though there's 33 medical states it's uh, it represents what close to 200 million people that's a larger addressable market than Canada so um, we're looking increasingly at new products that aren't available in Canada so whether it's beverages with CBD you know the farm bill has really uh, changed the dynamic mm -hmm. for the cannabis industry in the US uh, CBD products are available in thousands of locations outside the dispensary networks. There's branding, there's, there's marketing, and uh, so we've invested in a beverage company. It's called Hemp Hydrate. Uh, very simple, and we think it actually gets around some of the, you know, the lack of clarity that the FDA has presented, that it doesn't claim CBD, it doesn't claim to do anything doesn't cure ailments. It's very simple. It's actually a really cool bottle, and they're getting great traction out in California with uh, uh, intense or high-performance trainers because it's a recovery drink. Um, actually, Sylvester Stallone, when he was filming Rambo 4, had a box of, uh, of hemp hydrate. Mm. I think they filmed it in Bulgaria, and uh, from his trailer, he did some promo <laughs> on Instagram about hemp hydrate. So it's just a simple bottle, and uh, but it shows you the opportunity for what's coming in the U.S. And is that a publicly traded entity? No, nope, it's oh. a private company. Uh, they've raised capital a couple of times in the last year, and um, we are helping them with uh, you know possibly down the road listing oh. both in Canada okay. and the U.S. Great. So you'll be sure to let us know when there's an early stage investment opportunity. Absolutely. When they're looking for more, we'll tell you. <laughs> All right, Charles, let's leave it there for now. We'll come back to you soon. Thanks for joining me today. Okay. Thanks very much for having me. If you're enjoying the show, subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything in... <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Charles is always a yeah. quick study. Well, he, he talked read. about how they got into Tilray early. Yeah, and and you know the 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 ETF, which is is not as an active. What ETF? The e, the uh, HMMJ he was comparing to. Oh yeah, right. He said that they had to wait till the end of the quarter to make their changes to their thing. So the stock was they were buying it at much cheaper price than. Yeah. HMMJ. So it has to be early. Interesting. Well, you know what? I, I just don't think you can buy these things and not watch them. Like. Yeah. And that 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 could be a mistake, couldn't it? Oh yeah. Especially after you've you made a lot of money, you gotta. Sometimes it's hard to sleep when you've made a lot of money. Uh, I would think that's the case, but another gentleman who joins us today is uh, Mr. Bruce Linton, former CEO of Canopy Growth Corporation, uh, CEO founder of the world's largest and first cannabis company, uh, first publicly traded company. He joins us in studio now. Hey, I'm James West. And I'm Jeff Zaninieri. And we're here with Bruce Linton today to talk about early stage cannabis deals and how to get in on the next ones early. Bruce, welcome. Good morning. 
Bruce, it's been a little while now since you've left the uh, helm of Canopy Growth yep. Corporation, and I'm sure you've had time to scan the landscape for new and upcoming early stage cannabis deals. What is landscape look, looking like? How important yeah. is it for us to get involved early? Yeah, so um, you're right. The landscape scanning thing happened two ways. One is I went out and looked around, but a whole bunch of things came to me, like way more came to me than I could uh, find on my own. And what I figured out is, um, despite the view that the world might be flat, it's actually round, I believe, and that you have to look outside of Canada for a lot of stuff. And when I say that, um, you know, a government changes in Greece, that changes how you should look at Greece. Uh, when you think about the fact that there's now CBD actually moving under approval from places like Colombia to Germany, to say England, when England's actually having abilities to import and do medical research that weren't there a year ago. Uh, when you think about hemp, there's a lot of really smart hemp thoughts happening in places like Romania, headquartered out of the Netherlands. Uh, so extractors that are really good from South Korea might be good technologies to come into this space that aren't yet in the space. And so that, those are the things I'm seeing that <clears throat> are either transitions of expertise in you know, long-earned hemp stories or new regulatory frameworks that didn't exist and weren't positive a year ago to traditional uses of technologies that have stayed out of the space and are now ready to come in from foreign jurisdictions like a Korea. Hmm. Big, big difference, uh, uh, you know, a year and a few months makes when you, you look around. And so when you look around the world, you know, everyone's, a lot of people, myself included, are familiar with the amazing story of Canopy and how you organically turn that business into a juggernaut. But how did you navigate the business of money, not the business of mm. business? Because well, that's its own <coughs> art form, right? Yeah, it, it is, but what I'm seeing, so, so I'm seeing a lot of early deals, but I think they're not necessarily doing what I think you should do, which is, um, if you look at uh, a listing of, say, a company like WeWork or Uber, right. what's the problem with buying those stocks when they come out? They're over fully valued, right? right? So the VCs have jammed as much money in as they could. And if you were lucky enough to invest in them three years ago, good for you. But if you bought the deal at the deal, good luck. And so what I'm seeing in the sector now is a lot more of that, let's jam the full value up and then take it out so that there's no multiple opportunities for ups. These are just uh, too early promotes. And so what I like to do is a um, couple rules. One is you should raise less than you need. People say, what well, are you nuts? You just, you know, you got a $5 billion check. Well, that was the 17th round. But if you raise less than you need and if you're using a broker, they know you're coming back. And you never get a broker to do it. You got to do a lot of this stuff yourself with an investment maker. But if they know you're coming back, the analysts pay attention because they want the next deal. And so never over raise. And you say, well, that's crazy. No, you go back and back and back. The second thing is it's much easier to get the next raise if the first one wasn't overpriced because the people made money. Yeah. And they say, when's your next raise? And so you shouldn't think about it as one and done. You should think about if I had to do seven to 10 raises in succession. Am I setting myself up so that each one of these is a step up in valuation? Yeah. Rather than, I need this money now. And so um, the deals I've liked, the entrepreneurs I've liked, <coughs> have been a little bit more realistic, undervalued. Because, you know, what do you really give away? Like if you said, well, I think it's 200 million, and somebody says, well, I think it's 150 million. If you're raising seven or 10, the difference on dilution across that over a longer term of creating a bigger billion dollar company is irrelevant. That's very interesting that you pointed that out. I, I, my back Do you like owning WeWork? Do you like how that's traded for you or Uber? These, these things no, have been, the, the VC, it, and I see that's that. That's why we're here. But that's why I see some of the <laughs> pot model stuff. Yeah. Like people are trying to inflate it to the maximum early and then hand it into the market and hope that it doesn't crash before their trading hold comes off. But I mean, I, mean, I did a little bit of, you know, back of the napkin calculations on what you did and you returned over 30,000% for your investors. Yeah, and you know what? When I want to raise that going to happen money, again? Uh, can well, it? <laughs> it can. That is, if you, if you compared that across the time frame. So if you said 30,000%, but if you turn it said, and over a really short time, yeah, um, that is pretty hard to do again. But you can replicate a target model which says, I want to always have an increase in value before my next raise, right. which means don't start too high. That in mind, so you had a conservative, sober, interaction with the capital markets. Did you always have, did you raise money with clear intentions of what you needed it for? Uh, almost every round, 
with three specific ones, we're at the stage where without the money in short term, we're going to go to business. So we knew exactly what we we're going to spend that on. Um, but most of it, if you look at the allocation, it was creating capital assets, tangible things to use. And one of the things I'm finding in the cannabis space is people are jumping to the assumption that there are lots of cannabis and that part's easy. It's turning out not to be true in my opinion. So you have to look at if you don't spend enough money when you build the building to have great HVAC systems, so the heating, the cooling, the dehumidification, if you don't do that right, I don't care who the grower is, they can't do a good job. And the, so in some ways, I, I argued that um, capital was free and operating costs would kill you. And if you look at it that way, you're much more likely to spend twice as much today to have something that's half as costly to run tomorrow. And so when you're thinking about use of capital, it's almost better every time to build that kind of German engineered, rock solid, Efficiency. amazing thing yeah. that goes really quietly operates and uses almost no power. Right. And people say, oh, well, and I say, listen, it, you can say it another way. It decreases your carbon footprint. I had no idea how green I was until I figured out greenhouses and indoor operations that are using all kinds of heat exchangers use way less power, which means your carbon footprint's way less. Which really means it's kind of like running in Canada. We have these oil sands and they go dig in them and they take the stuff out and they give the resulting products away to Americans at a huge discount because we can't actually build the pipeline. Um, but that model, if you run those places, you don't get your bonus based on the profit. Each year, your bonus is dependent upon how much did you decrease the operating cost. Yeah. And so I think um, when I was raising money, I kept thinking about how do we buy the best stuff so that we can actually build it so that it'll be great to own forever. And I studied a little bit before this interview how you put together a company. It was like a conglomeration of deals you put together, right? 31, so, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of deals. <laughs> so, I mean, that's going to... Well, it, you know what? It, as, as sectors evolve, and uh, the game changed every quarter. Right. Right. So at one point in time, what you're trying to do is put pins on a map so you can build buildings across a geography. Then you're trying to go around the world. Then you're trying to get vertically integrated so you don't just grow the stuff, you extract the stuff. So you start buying people who are good at extraction. Yeah. Once you got that stuff going, you start saying, what the heck are we going to do with all these ingredients? Nice. And so you start buying. This morning, I, I was very, I, I smile, was happy. I was stayed at the Marriott and the shampoo I, they provide and the, the products are all, this works. So you start buying UK cosmetic companies that have products in the Marriott chain, thinking about how do we make CBD lines because they have had such great uh, product sets and distribution across 30 plus countries. So you can see how you can buy a lot of things when there's a whole multi-layer game you're playing across. It's tremendous. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty cool washing your hair, yeah. or what limited hair I have, <laughs> um, <laughs> with the Don't product from these guys. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, now, if my hair was a bad day, it must have been head and shoulders or something. But no, <laughs> it, uh, it, 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 you know, when you see that, and the Marriott right now is one of the, you know, they're big and I think they're kind of controlled out of Utah. Right. So it's kind of neat that a company controlled out of Utah has shampoo products and, and, and conditioner and stuff in their showers that are owned by a cannabis company. So what would be like a massive Weird, eh? red flag for you? I'm shifting gears <coughs> a little bit. Like if you were looking at acquiring a company or something, doing a big private deal where you're like, you know, we're going all in here. What would give you a little bit of pause where you just be like, you know what, I'm not, I'm just not feeling this. Well, so in the early days, uh, sometimes you look at the shareholders, even now. Interesting. Right? Like, um, I, I, if I'm doing, even now, when I'm looking at who I'm going to be involved with, I say, can I please see your entire cap table? Yeah. I want to know who's in. Because there are red flags in that category. Um, sometimes I look at and want to see, where are you with how many flags were thrown by a regulator? Really, if you have a frequent non-compliance, that is a problem we can fix, but we should identify and decrease the price. Mm. Um, I would say um, if they always, <laughs> we want all cash, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. So two uh, out of the three are the business of money. I yeah. mean, you're looking at the texture, the quality of their deal, how, yeah. they, how they composite the deal, how they put together their, their Well, and book. over time, you realize that what you don't need is more management. Yeah. So right. when you're doing a bunch of deals, you want to make sure they don't have crazy contracts. Like if I yeah. need to fire you, it shouldn't cost me as much as I paid for the company because I'm probably right. going to fire you. And right. it's not a mean way. It's just listen. Right. We don't need we don't need a whole bunch of people at the top. So uh, if we're going to only keep one out of five, what's that cost us? Stuff like that. Cool. How do you feel about financings where the principals have given themselves massive share positions? Like eighty percent of the equity has been 
allocated at sub five cents. What does that tell you about a potential investment? I like people who share. Now, probably, probably I'd have less time to be on your show if I was smarter and had set up a uh, voting trust, mm -hmm. which said something to that uh, control of voting, but that's not control of equity. Um, but I do think um, there's a lot to do in every sector, and I don't care if it's tech or marijuana or whatever. If you think that you should have most of the equity and you think that you should have most of the options, you're not going to be, in my experience, that's a not great success model. Mm -hmm. Who are you um, going to celebrate with? Well, yeah, and you know, it's, it's also just um, when you're not working and you're not there and things are still having to run, yeah. you don't have to worry about it because right. everybody cares. So I, I do like, um, I usually ask, what's the size of your option pool? How much is out? How early did you get out? Because you know you want people with hooks because you take those options and when you buy somebody you invert them. Scary if I'm going to lean game. in and put some cash in and put some time in, um, my goal is not to be in charge of everything within a couple hours because everybody else leaves. Well, thanks for joining us again. That was awesome. I so appreciate good. your contribution as usual. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed it. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. Yeah, well, so Bruce knows what he's talking about. He's not diminished his enthusiasm for the space at all. And uh, yeah, you're going to find out about the next early stage opportunities here on Midas Letter. Mm -hmm. Making money, making money, making money isn't funny. Uh, yeah, so quite the show today. And uh, tomorrow we're going to actually be live from 48 North uh, out in uh, near Bradford, Ontario. We are going to be live from the cannabis patch. We're going to be smoking live in the cannabis patch. Is that the cabbage patch? That's not the cabbage patch, though some people call cannabis cabbage as a sort of, you know, colloquialism. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you better bring your big fat corn cob pipe there, Eddie, about, if you uh, want to get high we on the get corn some patch. Panama red. Panama red. red no, cabbage. it's going to be Ontario red pink kush. No, actually, it's going to be hemp, and it's growing in the field, so there's nothing to smoke because it's still growing. Really. Ooh. What do you think about uh, uh, Aurora divesting itself of its uh, shares in uh, Awawa? Teagard. Well, I think uh, probably Aurora's, uh, you know, always looking for ways to bolster the treasury. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I can't comment on to what their impression is sure. of uh, Halo's, or rather Halo, of. Uh, of T God's business plan or business acumen or business success, but uh, um, yeah, I think they had to disclose that because they were an insider, and uh, that's that's all there is to be read into that. Certainly, uh, T God took a big hit with the announcement of a uh, large bot deal financing at quite the discount to market, though that's to be expected, and T God is now <coughs> going to be cashed up again. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's the silver lining here. Let's take a quick look at the T God chart. Yeah, Weed MD just raised ten million dollars. No kidding, eh? An adventure bot deal. Yeah, so T God's down to two ninety six. Um, wow. Yeah, sixteen million shares traded today. Yeah, that many. Yeah. Why? Why? Well, let's see. Press release. Uh, Green Organic Dutchman welcomes new investors. How's that for a way to talk about how you just raised some money? So they uh, did a total of 28.8 million shares at three bucks per unit. Uh, and they did that with Aurora. Uh, they did it with Aurora? They, well, they, took, they bought Aurora's position. They crossed Aurora's position out essentially by the looks of it. Uh, through and placed it with a syndicate of Canadian banks. Okay. Mm hmm So um, thus the drop in the share price. You're looking at that chart. Stock was uh, you know quite a bit higher. And so 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 that's T God, right? Oh, that sure is all day long. And what what, what are they? CNX? Uh, CSE. Yep. I just want to see something. No, here. sorry, sorry. TSE, not CSE. TSE. So T G O D. Hit the button. Yeah, but look at this chart. They dropped from essentially 
uh, three fifty. Three fifty all the way down to three dollars. Yeah, and at, at at support too. There's a, that's been down there a few times. Yeah, so basically gave back everything they gained since. So we got we got a support last there. Last week we got a support there, mm -hmm. and now we've sort of semi breached that support. Hmm. We may fill that gap first, but uh, yeah. So you know what, cash is king. This thing's been trading for quite a while. Yep. 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 Sixty-eight million shares. Um, you know, the uh, interesting thing about the cannabis market today on the, uh, on the indexes, as indicated by the indexes, is that they're trading mostly flat in a day when all of the other uh, yeah. asset classes are enjoying a more or less robust day to the upside, yeah. which is kind of, uh, kind of an interesting um, phenomenon because, you know, it's, it's, it's a change in that you never have you seen a day in the recent cycle where gold has been up on the same day that the S&P is up dramatically. And you seldom see a day where the S&P is up dramatically and the, t and the cannabis stocks don't move. And vice versa. And vice versa. So this is, you know, the cannabis sector as a whole, if we look at this here, is basically flat. And, uh, you know, the S&P, if we look at the... Uh, S and P, S and P, S and P. What's going on here? Uh, S P X. Oh my gosh, something's going on. Wow. Uh, and the S P X is uh, up 36 points on the day. Sorry, 31 points now. Wait a sec. Let's go into the one day here. My. Let's go into the one day. My thing is all screwed up. Is it? Yeah. So, oh, sorry, it's up 1.12% on the day now. And the S&P, I just want to get back to that before we sign up. Anyways, here. that's our show for today. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. If you haven't already, go to MidasLetter.com and sign up in the subscribe box, and you'll be getting our free daily market commentary. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow live from the field of 48 North. So long.